Greetings, this is General CJG here, coming to you with another video, here with my co-host. Wed Gentili, standing by. Yep, and this time we have a very special video to do this time. And this is one I've been wanting to do for a while and I didn't think it would happen, but here we are. So, introducing now our special guest and person we'll be interviewing right now, Michael A. Stackpole. Mr. Stackpole, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Michael A. Stackpole and I'm very happy to be here and I guess I'm here because I wrote a bunch of uh, novels, uh, the X-Wing novels and, and I, Jedi. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Yep, indeed. Uh, what other stuff have you done besides the X-Wing books? I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with your work. Um, well, I wish a lot more were, actually. Uh, I've written uh, close to 60 novels uh, and uh, uh, in uh, original novels. Um, uh, as well as, uh, and I've written science fiction, mysteries, military science fiction, a lot of fantasy, uh, urban fantasy, you know, I did pretty much anything and everything. Uh, a lot of short stories as well. Uh, but I've written in the Battletech universe, the Conan universe, oh. uh, Magic the Gathering, um, let's see, uh, yeah, Star Wars, um, sure there are a bunch of others and for some reason i'm just forgetting but uh but yeah it, it this is what i do for a living so uh, <laughs> it's a job i enjoy and uh, it occupies a lot of my time awesome so without further ado shall we begin which we shall so um okay i want to get uh, start with this one to get it out of the way because it's like a question i've been dying to like sort of ask it's um, what inspired the creation and characterization of like Corrin Horn? Had you always intended to tell his story the way it has been published, or did you want to do more with the character? Um, well, there, there are a couple questions there. Um, the uh, uh, what inspired uh, Corrin and having him come out the way he was is that um, as I was looking to put together a Rogue Squadron. I realized that I was going to need a, a brand new character, an outsider coming in to learn how things work. Uh, I wanted him to be a, to be a very, very good pilot. Um, and I also knew that he needed a, uh, you know, spoiler alert. Um, you know, he needed a Jedi background. Um, and, uh, the strong pilot characters seemed to be Corellians in the universe, especially at that time. And you had Han Solo and you had Wedge. And the thing with Han and Wedge is that they both had uh, outlaw smuggler aspects uh, <laughs> to their background, certainly. Um, Scoundrels. Han Solo, yeah, Han Solo far more, than, uh, uh, far more than, than Wedge. And one of the things I really dislike in science fiction is when uh, worlds are seen as monocultures. You know, the idea that all Corellians are smugglers. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, if there are smugglers, there has to be the equivalent of a Coast Guard. And so that's kind of where I started and shaped Corsac. And uh, that meant that Corrin would have a, a negative opinion of people who had been smugglers. And that would give him an issue to try and work past uh, for... Um, uh, in, in dealing with Wedge and eventually in I, Jedi, uh, an issue that he had to work past um, in dealing with uh, Han Solo. Um, I also knew from just the research that I'd done about fighter pilots, they tend to be, uh, well, in talking to fighter pilots, they tend to be cocky. And uh, so I, I needed that personality to be able to come through. Um and I wanted him to be a contrast, a rougher form uh, of an individual that Wedge could uh, Wedge could help shape and mature. You know, the thing about Wedge uh, was this, that Wedge is an incredibly hot uh, fighter pilot. So we know he's got to have the ego there. And yet he's always described as being Luke Skywalker's best friend, which means that there has to be a lot of heart there. Uh, otherwise... Luke wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. So that's how I shaped Wedge to be in that leadership mentoring role. And then Corrin was coming in to be somebody 
that Wedge would get to educate and lead to his full potential. So that's how those things went. In terms of uh, Corin, and did I ever want to tell more stories about him, uh, I certainly would be open to that. Oh. Um, you know, as it was with uh, the new Jedi Order uh, and, the, and the two... Um, the duology, the, the Dark Tide duology? Yeah, yeah, the the yeah the Dark Tide duology, um, the uh, with the two of those books, um, I brought uh, Corin to a place where it wasn't so much that I was done with him, but it was a stopping point that I was okay with. I didn't think that there was a lot left undone that I wanted to take care of immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but had you know had I been asked back. Uh, there certainly was more that could be done with the character. So, I see. So, uh, anything else on that? No, I'm I'm good. Okay. So, uh, awesome. Next question. Uh, it kind of goes into Corn Horn. So, um, I or should you tell it what? Since actually you read the X-wing books. <laughs> uh, here's like another one because uh, like recently for the new Star Wars films and even like some of the newer expanded material. There's this theme of like a uh, new found family where someone could have a family that is beyond their own like bloodline that it could be made of like friends or like people like you have just met like I would I would say coworkers but like I don't know if that applies in a rebellion but like and I and I noticed this theme strongly in the X-wing books was this like an intention f- of of yours to do this like was the squadron meant to be a new family for Karen Horn since he had lost his father to Bosk? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, again, when I was doing the research, uh, and in doing research, I read a lot of, uh, I talked to pilots, I also read a lot of uh, pilot biographies. Um, one of the things that you find is that uh, the, uh, the squadron or any military unit does become a family. You know, one of the things that I did, one of the weird things when I was researching uh, was that um, when you were a member of a squadron uh, in combat and new replacement people came in, very often the older members of the unit would not want to get to know them because they had already lost uh, a lot of friends and they didn't want to lose any more friends. And if you read through Rogue Squadron, Wedge never addresses any of the new pilots that he's dealing with on a first name basis as friends until the end of the book, until they've survived five missions. Because one of the other things that I found in doing the research is that if you are a fighter pilot, chances are you will die before you've completed your fifth mission or after your 15th mission that, that it takes you that long to get used to it, to understand what's going on. And so wedge was, you know, deliberately holding himself apart. But once that reticence breaks down, once you realize these people are going to be around and they're going to be there for you. And I think that that's a pretty good definition of, of family in, in the way you're talking about, um, then, you know, then you form a very strong connection. Uh, and so that's really very much what I was going for there. Um, and, you know, I think we see it even uh, today when you have people, uh, reunions of military units. Uh, my, my brother went to West Point and his uh, cadet company still gets together for reunions. Uh, even though it's you know about 40 years now since uh, since he got out of West Point, because there's something about that bonding uh, that does make them very much of a family. Okay. Wow! Nice, nice, awesome. Thanks for that one. Next question. Uh, this is an in, uh, one that I am particularly curious on. So, how well were your, your original ideas for the X-wing novels translated on the page? As seen, were there times where George Lucas or Lucasfilm had to veto ideas, and did it become easier to write as you produce more books for Star Wars? Um, great question. 
Um, the fact is, uh, Lucasfilm was very generous with me, and they basically never said never. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, they, 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 they allowed me to do all the stuff I wanted to do. Uh, the only exception was very early on in the planning stages, because I was filling out the entire squadron, uh, I asked whether or not it would be possible to have a Mandalorian uh, in the squadron, hmm. just because I liked that look. Um, hmm. And at the time, Mandalorians were not at all defined. But when I asked, uh, Lucasfilm said that George had said no that George apparently had something in mind for them uh, at, at that point. Uh, but otherwise, no, Lucasfilm was very generous. And, and as I've said before, um, Lucasfilm allowed me to get away with things that I would not have allowed me to get away with. So they were they were very trusting, and, and it was a joy to work for them because they really gave, I felt they gave me as a, as a creative uh, uh, individual, uh, as much latitude as I needed, uh, to get the story told. Mm, awesome. So George was, was involved in the creation of the X-Wing books then? At the time, the way it was explained to those of us authors that, uh, when we sent material in, we were allowed to ask up to five yes or no questions that they would take to uh, George uh, to be answered. Um, I don't think I ever had any questions that had to go that high, uh, mainly because what they wanted me to do was fairly well defined. Uh, And and, uh, I think the the Mandalorian question was pretty much the only question that that ever went to George and got uh, got, uh, rejected. Oh, I see. Awesome. Do you have, uh, like, like, do you have any information on this, like, almost the Mandalorian character that you were going to create? No, you know, that would have been that would have been something that would have worked in the in as, as the books got developed. Um, I, you know, I again, I, I just liked the armor. I liked the look. I liked the attitude. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I would have it would have been fun to have a Mandalorian in. But literally at that time, we didn't even know if Mandalorians were human. Uh, much less what they actually were. So, uh, you know, I literally was just going by a visual uh, and would have worked from there. And I think, again, with them having plans, uh, they didn't want to let anyone else play. Conversely, uh, when it came to doing Earl, uh, doing the Gand, um, I asked Lucasfilm for more information because all I had found was a couple of a couple of images and a very sparse uh, uh, entry in the Star Wars Encyclopedia at the time. And so I asked Lucasfilm for any more information they had, and I got sent uh, photocopies of all the material I'd already found with a note on it saying, this is what we've got, knock yourself out. Uh, and so being able to develop the way Gan speak, the fact that they don't need oxygen, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that was all stuff that they let me do. Mm, awesome. That is awesome. That is super awesome. Somewhat of a follow-up of the previous question. Uh, what was it like working with Lucasfilm and other writers like Aaron Alliston, Timothy Son, etc.? Did you have to coordinate often with them or was it a free-for-all knock yourself out? <laughs> um, there, was, there was coordination uh, between us. The, the process changed uh or altered slightly when uh the license went from bantam to del rey and then random house which owned bantam bought del rey Hmm. um and the and the process you know shifted especially after the the phantom menace but up to that point while it was still uh while it was still with bantam um they really uh, they let the authors uh talk to each other um Uh, And and when I say they let us, uh, basically, we talked to each other. We also let Lucasfilm know that we were talking to each other. And anything that we came up with was was cleared past Lucasfilm just because of the the approval process, uh, regardless. But they had no problem with us talking to each other um, uh, back and forth. Uh, 
you know, when uh, when Tim and I were doing, uh, he was doing uh, Spectre of the Past, and I was doing uh, I Jedi. Uh, we were regularly sending chunks of manuscript uh, back and forth to each other, and this was back in the days when we were actually sending manuscripts. Uh, so this is how long ago that was, um, uh, and this was this was how Tim and I were able to coordinate. Uh, with uh, Elagos's uh, development, because Tim created Elagos, and I regressed him 15 years, wrote the stuff in iJedi, and then mailed all that off to Tim, who then uh, uh, aged him 15 years and finished off telling his story, and then I got to deal with him in the in the Dark Tide books, uh, and and kind of finish his story. Um, so. Yeah, we talked back and forth, and 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 it was a lot of fun because we were able to uh, to coordinate uh, things that way. Also, I was doing Dark Horse comics at the time, mm-hmm. so stuff that I was doing for Bantam, or stuff that I would talk to Tim about, uh, would both show up in the novels and then would feed into the comics. Uh, uh, literally, if you look at the Union comic mm-hmm. in uh, in the Back to War. We give the errant venture to Booster. Ah. In Vision of the Future, we take the errant venture away from Booster to borrow it, uh, with the with the promise that it will re- be repaired and repainted. And then, if you look at the uh, Union graphic novel, there is actually a panel in there where the errant venture has been repaired, and they're beginning to paint it red. Ah, uh, yeah. So, you know, we were able to do fun things like that, just shooting stuff back and forth. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, re- I, read, I read those books and Union, and yeah, that I, I did notice that the Star Destroyer was not the same color as a regular Star Destroyer, so that's a pretty cool detail. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it, was, it was just a lot of fun, and, and we knew that, you know, obviously we were enjoying being able to do that sort of stuff, and we knew that the, we knew that the readers would enjoy it as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Creativity in creativity is one of the big pillars of Star Wars. Uh, one of the reasons why most people love it. So yeah. So uh, next question is: um, Did you choose to write about Rogue Squadron? If you were not writing for Rogue Squadron, would you want to do something else, or what? And if so, what would you have done? Well, there wasn't really any question of me thinking about other stuff. Um, because they literally, uh, the offer to me was, we want you to write four military science fiction books, uh, set in the star Wars universe. Uh, and you know, I mean, rogue squadron was the only choice. Now I had very early on when I just first knew Tim, we were at a, at a convention and Tim's, um, star Wars books had just come out. And, uh, like every other author in the world, uh, you know, uh, they would talk to Tim and say, oh, I've got an idea for a Star Wars book. And Tim and I were waiting to get a bus to the airport at an ungodly early hour in the morning, one <laughs> morning. And, uh, and I, I mentioned to him, I said, yeah, I had an idea for, uh, uh, for a, uh, uh, for a novel. I said, I, I wanted to do a novel, um, called, uh, the man in Boba Fett's mask, uh, having the idea that whoever was in Boba Fett's armor and got eaten by the Sarlacc was not actually Boba Fett. That someone had stripped him out of the armor, uh, and that's why he was so incompetent on mm. uh, on the barge and and got eaten. Uh, and so it would be, you know, it would be uh, whoever it would be Boba Fett escaping from uh, uh, Jabba's palace, getting his armor back, and then going off to do whatever. Uh, and it was not. It was many years later that I listened to Tim, we were doing a panel and he said, you know, he said, all these people kept telling me they had ideas for star Wars novels. And he said, he said, you know, yours was the only one that I actually thought would be interesting. Uh, but that had to be two years before I ever got the shot at doing the, uh, doing the, uh, rogue squadron novels. You know, the other thing, which is funny after I got the rogue squadron novels and thought about this forever and ever and ever, um, I, uh, I finally called him up and I said, okay, uh, I've got this contract to write Star Wars novels. I've gotten my phone number unlisted. I've got a post office box. What else do I need to know? 
<laughs> and uh, and Tim said, ah, a man who learns from someone else's mistakes. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, but yeah, and like I say, you know, all of the authors. I mean, uh, Tim uh, and uh, uh, Kevin J. Anderson, everybody uh, were just oh. unbelievably nice uh, when we were coordinating back and forth, and certainly Aaron, who I'd known uh, forever and ever and ever. Uh, uh, I, I enjoyed the coordination, the stuff we got to pass back and forth as he did the, the race squadron novels. Mm. That's awesome. So, um, which shall we go to the next question? Sure. Okay. Um, so like you had mentioned like the union comic at the time, like how big of a deal was it? Like, did you have insight from other writers putting into it from Lucasfilm? Like, how did you approach basically the marriage of Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade. So what ended up happening was this. Um, the license had just switched over to uh, Del Rey. Mm -hmm. Tim was just finishing up Vision of the Future. And, uh, or actually, Vision of the Future was going to be coming out. What Dark Horse wanted was a six-issue miniseries that would take place at the end of Spectre leading into Vision. Mm -hmm. okay, I mean, it, in, in, uh, you know, in story time, there's like 15 minutes there. Uh, and what I had proposed was we do a story. Uh, it would involve uh, Wedge and his wife. It would go more in-depth into what was going on uh, uh, in uh, on a particular world to sort of reflect on one world what was going on in the in the grander um, empire and, and new republic um, and there was some hemming and hawing back and forth and unfortunately uh, the window closed for being able to do that six issue miniseries so my editor came back to me and say yeah we've only got four issues now and they've said no to that what well, what can we do and I said and I, I, I remembered from when I was a kid, having read the big comic that was the marriage of uh, Reed Richards and Sue Storm, uh, you know, the Fantastic Four. And I said, why don't we do the marriage of Luke and Mara Jade? And all of a sudden, everybody thought that was a brilliant idea. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's how it. Uh, you know that was that was the genesis of it, and then it was just a question of, of uh, of writing it up, and uh, and so that was a lot of fun. That was also the only time that I really ever, I had one of those geek out moments where <laughs> I, I was just started doing issue three, and I and and it just struck me, oh my god, I'm marrying off two icons, <laughs> um, and that was the you know that was that was the only time that I really was aware of this whole this whole meta thing going on. Uh, so I freaked out for about five minutes and then went back to work. <laughs> nice. I wonder awesome. what George, I wonder what George thought of that comic union. I'm curious. Did you, I, I have no clue whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just a random. I can question. imagine it's like a father seeing his son being married off. It's like he both <laughs> approves, but like disapproves and stuff like that. Like he's all kinds of motions. <laughs> that, that, that could, in fact, I, I suppose that could in fact be it. Uh, all I know is, all I know is I was not banned from Skywalker ranch after that point. So I guess it was okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, nice. So, awesome. Next question. Um, did you prefer, like, now that since you've had at that point written comics and novels, like, what did you prefer writing for? Um, you know, I'm 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 a novelist. Uh, I, I'm very used to to writing in the narrative style, uh, and I'm really comfortable with that. But um, comics, which are a, a graphic storytelling style. Um, I've always enjoyed, um, certainly read comics before I ever read novels. Um, so I really, I really, really like doing those mainly because, um, I got to collaborate with artists and I got to do some, uh, fairly cool stuff, you know, in, in a novel or in a, in a, in a graphic novel, you can have things happening in the foreground and things happening in the background. And 
you can never do that in a narrative novel mm -hmm. because just mentioning something happening in the background literally pulls it into the foreground when you're doing narrative. But graphically, uh, obviously, you can have a character, you literally could have a conversation start in the foreground and then move into the background while another conversation comes into the foreground. And both things can be continuing, one through body language and one through actual uh, uh, language. And, and to me, that was just so much fun to play that way uh, that I really, uh, I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, Pete James was my editor uh, at Dark Horse and uh, my second editor at Dark Horse. Uh, and he was just, he was great at, at helping me out. And, uh, another writer, Jan Stranod was, uh, he did two of the, two of the first five story arcs he scripted and he was very nice in sending me, uh, uh, some of his scripts and basically showing me how it was done so that when I started with, um, uh, I started with issue 21, I think, and, and, and scripted the rest of the run. Uh, and that was a big thrill. I really enjoyed that. Oh, nice. That That's awesome. <laughs> so definitely must have been different writing for a comic compared to a novel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you literally, you know, you have to be making all your uh, all your little uh, plants. It, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. I've got a neighbor who's using a weed whacker. Um, <laughs> and it becomes obtrusive. I'll just go and shoot him. Um, <laughs> Good joke. Uh, or throw a beer at him. I don't know. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, you know, you to to do a graphic novel, you have to uh, uh, you uh, you literally have to sit down and plan out what your panels are going to look like, uh, plan out where the page breaks are going to be, uh, so you can do transitions in between page breaks and stuff like that. It was it like I say, it was an entirely different set of skills. Uh, and, uh, and I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed putting that together a very great deal. I'd love to do comics again. You know? Oh, nice. <laughs> that would be so cool. Cause like from union to like even the X-Wing comics, they're just so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, indeed. So next question. This is one I've been wondering because, okay. I Jedi, it's, it's written from a first person perspective and you could even say it's more different than other works of Star Wars. It, it, not just comparing to your other works, uh, Mr. Sackpole, but also other books, mostly because it's first person perspective. So my question is, how was that like planned or developed? How did Lucasfilm uh, react to the idea of it? And also did you work closely with Kevin J. Anderson to make the book fit in Jedi Academy since he was kind of a retcon of Jedi Academy? How did that work? Right. Um, so two or three things. I had talked with uh, Tom Dupree, who was my editor uh, for Star Wars at Bantam, and told him about... Uh, we, were at a, we were at a convention, and we were just having lunch. And I told him about, essentially, the story of iJedi as what I saw as a continuation of, of uh, Corrin's story. And, and I said, you know, it's one I would want to tell first person... Because in none of these stories have we been inside, really been inside a Jedi to feel what it is to use the Force, ah. to, to, to feel all that. And I think, and I said, I, I think Star Wars really needs that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but I had no idea what to title it or anything like that. And Tom, uh, you know, Tom just nodded and said, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. And then I think I saw him four months later. And he said, uh, hey, look, you know, uh, you're going to be doing I, Jedi. And I'm going, <laughs> I'm doing which? And he said, you know, the Corrin book. I was like, oh, okay. Because that was the other thing is that I had also talked with Tim about what I saw as Corrin's uh, projected future. And uh, Tim, when he was doing Vision of the Future, Inspector, was going ahead and writing Corrin as if I had already written that future out. <laughs> so he was treating my speculation as canon. Um, and so uh, Tom basically explained to me that when he went to, they went to Lucasfilm to propose a new set of books. And uh, the one that he led with was I Jedi and uh, Lucasfilm signed off on it. And so there it was. And it, so from the beginning, 
we knew that it was going to be uh, first person ah. to get you that inside feel of, of what it was like. Um, I don't think anybody ever expected it would be as long as it was, but <laughs> but there you go. That much is um, true. <laughs> that that stuff happens. <laughs> nice. and it, I, you had a second. You had a second half to that question. I've forgotten what it was. Oh, that if you work with Kevin J. Anderson while writing *I Jedi*, since he was the author of *Jedi Academy* trilogy, right? Uh, Kevin, I, I've known Kevin forever. Uh, I mean, I literally was Kevin's first editor <laughs> uh, way back when, um, uh, for when he was doing some gaming stuff. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, what I did was I sat down with uh, the *Jedi Academy* trilogy, and I did a full breakdown on the books. To figure out where I could insert uh, Corn Horn in there, um, and uh, I, I did this. I had that idea to do this because of Frederick Forth, Forsyth's book, uh, *The Day of the Jackal*, where uh-huh. he did exactly that. Wove something through real, real-world history. Uh, wove a fiction uh, through that, and I had loved that novel since I was in college. Um, so uh, that was that idea. I broke it down, uh, figured out where to put Corin in. Um, Kevin had deliberately only named six of the 12 uh, students precisely so someone else could be slipping characters in. And um, there were even, I, I, when I broke it down, I was careful to count who was where. Uh, and how many people were at any one point or in any any particular scene so I'd get all the continuity right. And uh, there was actually one scene where he had only accounted for 11 apprentices, hadn't accounted for the 12th, and that's uh, uh, that was the scene where uh, Corrin uh, flies out with that creature on the uh, front of a... Uh, front of a uh, speeder, not a speeder, but... Uh, it's not an X-wing, but it's a prototype of X-wing, um, and uh, went up into the atmosphere and came back down. Uh, I think I know which portion uh, you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's the scene where uh, where um, Luke uh, helps his nephew destroy some monsters. Mm, um, yeah. So, uh, but it was you know we it was it was fun to be able to coordinate things through that uh, through that novel and and. Uh, you know, do no damage, but be able to have I Jedi woven through there, uh, such that it uh, such that it really stuck. Awesome. So, and, and I will say this: mm-hmm. I do remember uh, as I was getting down to the end of I Jedi, I did call Kevin on the phone, and I said to him, "I said, hey, Kevin, are you doing anything with that uh, Sith temple? Uh, you know, when in in because they were doing the Young Jedi Knights books." Uh, at that point, uh, I said, you doing anything with the Sith temple? And he said, Nope. And I said, great. I'm destroying it. Um, <laughs> so did he like so, react like, uh, wait, what? <laughs> no, no, he was, I, I, you, you, Kevin, like I say, Kevin, Kevin is, Kevin's a lot of fun. I've known him forever. And it's like, Hey man, you know, that's what it's there for. Go for it. Have fun. <laughs> Oh my god, that, I, I'm already imagining that phone call. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so, anything else on that one, Mister Stock? No, no. I, I think I think I think I remember all the parts, or, or gave you the right answers. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, which? Uh, well, this next question is about um, the story of Dark uh, Dark Tide Siege. Like, what do you have, like? any idea of why it was canceled like are you allowed to talk about it what was going to happen in it and like did the content of it make it to other novels either written by you or by other authors yeah originally i had a three book deal and remember this was at the time when the books shifted from del rey to or shifted from bantam to del rey uh and um also when the phantom menace had come out Mm -hmm. and when the phantom menace came out there seemed in the whole approval process to be an extra layer of um extra layer of input that we had never had before Mm. uh and um as a result 
with Onslaught, um, mm. I got a 16-page revision memo. Hmm. And I just don't get 16-page revision memos. Hmm. Um, and so uh, I, I knew that if I made the changes that were requested in, in that memo, that the book would be horrible. And I wasn't going to have a book be horrible in the Star Wars universe and go out over my name. So I wrote Bantam a note, and I said, uh, uh, I, I, I wrote them a 17-page note explaining why these things in the revision memo, the ones that were really, really bad, explaining why they were really, really bad. Uh, and, uh, and I said, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to make these changes. Um, you know, where, to whom do I send the check for my advance? You can have it back. And, uh, as we negotiated out what was going to go on, I basically said, look, I'm not putting up with this for two more novels. So we agreed that, uh, to, to just do Onslaught and Ruin. Um, and the events that were going to be in Siege, um, the ones that, that needed to be included, that were points that had to be hit, showed up in Ruin. Um, you know, I, I, Siege was not going to be your typical second book in a trilogy, which is just sort of marking time until we get to the third book. But there was a lot of stuff there that wasn't vital. So we basically freed up a book in the contract for them to give it to someone else to do to do some other stuff. Um, and uh, and so that's that's what happened there. Oh. Uh, so I did, you know, I did Onslaught. I did Ruin. Uh, they both hit the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruin hit, went the highest that any of my books uh, had done so great books. um you know that was successful um but that was that was that hmm. awesome interesting, so um, interesting it is indeed ne next question uh si since we talked about dark dark tide siege which it was canceled are there any other novels or works of yours that ended up being canceled uh, and some that even probably you have never even heard of that were canceled um no, the the certainly not in Star Wars. Um, the the only book that I've got that got written and hasn't come out and it hasn't come out yet was um, a book uh, in the Conan universe, oh. and uh, it's just a question of of uh, uh, publishing deals and when stuff is going to uh, when stuff is going to come together and and be able to come out. So. so. Um, but other than that, no, pretty much everything that, uh, everything I've written has seen print. Um, and, uh, uh yeah, uh, at least un unless I'm forgetting something and I don't think I am. Uh, so. Okay. Nice. Which next question. Um, so what was the inspiration behind, uh, your son, I saw it like, what did it take to sort of create her? Because as she was one of the first major female villains of the franchise, was it always planned to have her be a woman, or was that something that was like uh, thought of later uh, down, late, like later on in the timeline of like her creation? Did you ever want to do more with her beyond the X-wing uh, books and comics? Um, you know, uh, literally, my instruction was, my original instruction was. We want military science fiction in the Star Wars universe. That was all I got. Uh, you know, and, and about three weeks later, I got a call saying, oh, yeah, you probably want to use Wedge Antilles. So that was the sum and total of instruction that I got. Um, <laughs> you know, I was the one that said to them, hey, uh, since in Tim's books, we know that the New Republic has a Coruscant or Coruscant. Um, and we know at the end of Return of the Jedi, it's not been taken yet. Uh, can I do the invasion and taking of the capital homeworld um, or the, you know, the Imperial homeworld? Because I thought that if 
readers didn't want to read about guys flying X-Wings, at the very least, they would be interested in the fall of, of the Imperial homeworld. Um, so to facilitate that, and Lucasfilm said, sure, knock yourself out. Uh, to facilitate that, I needed to have somebody who was running the Empire at the time. And it couldn't be Thrawn, or it couldn't be Thrawn-like, um, because any strong male military leader at that point, the way those books were being uh, being published, would have been compared to Thrawn and would have compared badly to Thrawn. Mm. So the obvious thing for me to do then was to have this character be political, have this character be treacherous, have this character be female. And uh, so uh, uh, there are countless examples of the leaders of the secret police, like uh, Berea or uh, uh, Andropov in Russia uh, and other people elsewhere uh, who move into a leadership role. And that's what I decided to do. I decided that I would take the equivalent of uh, the KGB uh, uh, the Imperial KGB and put them on the throne. Uh, and, uh, you know, Lucasfilm was happy to have a, a female villain. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I literally designed her to do everything so that we weren't going to have a super weapon of the month. <laughs> uh, you know, and I designed her to be very political because her using the Kratos virus, uh, is designed literally to bankrupt uh, the New Republic, or split it down the middle between humans and non-humans, um, and it's a and hers is a very cruel, very cruel strategy, um, and 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 one that would be highly effective. Um, I, I, it's been kind of funny revisiting uh, all of these ideas uh, with the pandemic raging, uh, <laughs> because you get to see so much of the same dynamics taking place. It's kind of scary. Oh, God. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned Super Warfare of the Month. Was that like a sort of uh, the norm for Bantam era uh, books or something? Like, was it like a, in a checklist or something or just a no, coincidence? It, it, it wasn't in a checklist, but it, it's understandable how it showed up. Um, each of the authors that was approached was given a lot of latitude. And I think when any of them look at Star Wars movies, uh, you know, in, in the three movies we had to deal with then, there is a super weapon in two of them. Granted, the super weapon is not very effective, but there's a super weapon in two of them. So it's very easy to get the impression that you know, a super weapon is the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's real easy for, again, I think for writers to say, okay, if this is the model, then I want to make sure that what I'm doing is going to appeal to the audience and the audience appears to expect super weapons. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of room for a lot of variations on that theme, uh, you know, down to the point of having things that aren't super weapons. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I see. So, next question is: um, Were there other existing Star Wars characters that you wanted to tackle, like you did for Mara Jade? Are there any other characters that were never fully realized? Um, you know the 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 characters. I mean, Mara Jade using Mara Jade was was an honor and a privilege, um, and uh, getting to write with Tim. Uh, was was great um and so you know uh, i would use mara jade tim would use uh you know one of my characters you know we and we swapped stuff back and forth because uh, i got to use talent card uh and then in a short story I got to use thrawn uh and and that was just a lot of fun that was you know friends playing back and forth i think that um you know otherwise i got to use all the characters that i wanted to use um, you know, again, Lucasfilm never said no, uh, and I choose, chose to use characters that were appropriate for the story. Um, you know, my guys were, they were the cutting edge of 
uh, the New Republic Armed Forces. Uh, they weren't going to be privy to a lot of high-level meetings and stuff like that. Uh, but when it was necessary, I got to use those characters. So I, I feel I don't feel that there was anything left undone. I think that the only character that I created that would have been that I I thought had a lot more potential and would have been fun to do something was was in the uh, uh, Dark Tide books, uh, the Jedi Ganner. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought he would have an interesting arc uh, to play with. So, mm -hmm. but otherwise, no, I, I'm 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 actually quite satisfied with with what I got to do. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Which? Uh, so I have another question. This one's for Suntir Fell. Like I always saw him as basically the opposite, in a sense, of Wedge Antilles, as because he is like the Empire's pilot. What was like the inspiration behind uh, Suntir Fell? Had you always expected him to become such a fan favorite, like even nowadays? You know, that's a really good question. Um, where where he came from was uh, Pete Chains, my editor at Dark Horse, and I were talking. And uh, as we'd been doing four-issue story arcs, we would have a force base arc. We'd have a military arc. You know, we'd have, you know, weird other thing arcs. And so we decided it was time for a military arc again. Uh, just as the way we were rotating things through. And Pete and I were on the phone, and the subject of the Red Baron came up. Uh, and so we decided that, that uh, you know, I would create Baron Fell, the best Imperial pilot ever, essentially the Imperial Red Baron. And uh, so I was jotting down notes, and Tim Zahn calls. And, you know, after pleasantries, Tim said, uh, so what have you been doing? And I said, well, today I created the best Imperial pilot ever. <laughs> Without I'm missing a beat, Tim says, really? What's his name? I can use him. And, uh, and so literally Tim and I proceeded to chat for about 45 minutes uh, and put together uh, Baron Fell's entire career. Um, you know, I typed it up, sent Tim a copy, uh, used that as the basis for issue 25 of, uh, uh, of the X-Wing comics, uh, which introduces us to, uh, well, it doesn't introduce us to Baron Fell, but gives us his backstory. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Tim used him in, in, uh, visions of the future. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing, which is really funny about that bio Tim and I had been working off that bio for three years, I'm thinking, uh, when I went to a meeting at, at Lucasfilm. And, uh, and after we broke for lunch, I was talking to Sue Rastoni uh, as we were heading down to lunch. And I pulled out of my, uh, my uh, folder uh, this, this biography of uh, Baron Fell. And I, I said, uh, look, I brought this with me. It's, you know, this, it's the bio of Baron Fell that Tim and I have been working from if you would and I was going to say if you would like a copy and she just took it out of my hand and said thank you very much <laughs> so so there you go so that's in the that's in the Lucasfilm archives somewhere uh <laughs> you know as the uh as the uh the the biography of uh, of Baron Fell um uh, and we knew it's really funny when the first comic came out uh, within two weeks of the first comic coming out, uh, Pete Jane sent me a photograph that uh, someone had sent him of a custom action figure of Baron Fell. Uh, and so we had an inkling uh, right then with issue one that Baron Fell was going to be really, really popular. Uh, and, the, and the place where I knew that it really, that, that Fell had gotten into the minds of fans was uh, a little bit later that year at Dragon Con, ah. uh, the the four, pro, five hundred first, which again this was twenty years ago, so it was <laughs> you know the very beginnings of it. Um, there were pilots standing around in the uh, in the Hyatt uh, in the Hyatt uh, lobby, and uh, some of them had red stripes on their black flight suits, and I remember looking at that and thinking to myself. 
if I had not created Baron Fell, those guys would still be there. But not a single one of them would have a red stripe on their uniforms, <laughs> and <laughs> and that that just told me that that he had been there. What has happened with the fells since has you know been beyond anything I would have imagined, uh, and I think is just is just wonderful. That is actually amazing <clears throat> to think like like us uh, like that just made such an impact on even just a few people to put it on their costume. Like that's really awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I, and, and people have been, people have been unbelievably nice, uh, and respectful in times when they've costumed characters and, and stuff like that. You know, the number of people that have come up and said, Hey, what do you think? You know, is this, is this the way you see it? Uh, or, you know, the guys that I see running around in, in, uh, instead of orange flight suits, they're running around in green flight suits. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, I think that's just, it's just very, very cool. <laughs> it's actually my next project was actually to do a green flight suit for Curran Horn. <laughs> like funny you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, speaking of like that, um, the whole the whole biography of Baron Fell. Was there anything that was in there that never made it onto the page, or was like everything that's there we know about it? Um, I think most of it is out. I. To be very honest, I haven't looked at the document for uh, at least 15 years, so there may be a few details in there that uh, uh, that you know Tim didn't put in or I didn't put in. But I think most everything is there. Hmm. All right, I see. Awesome. So, okay, next question. This is a. Uh... And it, uh, this is one we'd like to get your thoughts on. So how did you feel about the decanonization of the expanded universe on April 25, 2014? Like, did you expect it? Or, and would you ever return to make new novels for, for the new canon under Disney? And if so, and also which characters would you want to see returning the new canon? Well, let's take this in, let's take this in, in, in steps. Um, we always knew uh, uh, that our stuff could be decanonized. Um, you know, a movie could, could run right over it. Uh, we certainly had seen that, uh, with Phantom Menace come up where, uh, you know, Darth Vader's age, uh, I think they, they cut, well, I think when I was first doing things, the Clone Wars were 58 years ago. Uh, and then after Phantom Menace and the new movies, uh, suddenly the Clone Wars were 18 years ago. They retconned um, it. So we always knew that there could be those those adjustments. And I think all of us writers had fully accepted that. Um, and I don't think I don't think the, the reading public in general knew that that we were aware. So to my knowledge, you know, none of the writers were angry about it because it wasn't a surprise to any of us. Mm. Um, I think that one of the things that has been uh, one of the things that's been missed is that in the press release that that got sent out, um, yes, they decanonized the books, but they also said that they're going to be resources and they will draw from them as they go forward, so that nothing is lost. It's just a question of when someone decides uh, that they want to play with. Uh, uh, it just depends on when they want to play with stuff uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of would I ever come back? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I'd be happy to do, uh, anything they thought I could do a good job at, uh, and whether it was writing more novels or, you know, if they suddenly decide they want to do, uh, a live action or an animated X wing, oh. uh, you know, I would be more than, more than happy to, uh, to help out. I, I me mean, personally, I kind of hope that it's a live action, uh, X-Wing, because I want to lobby to be um, a pilot in an X-Wing just for a couple of episodes or, you know, about 10 seconds on screen if it's a movie. Because then I can go to conventions just carrying a small box of photographs to be autographed to sell at shows as opposed to carrying around five pallets of books. Mm. So. So that's me. I, I want to make the transition from, you know, writer to screen star just because it'll be easier on my back. <laughs> um, 
Okay. But no, I, I literally, you know, I'd be be happy to play with anything. And whether they wanted me to do with Corrin or other characters, uh, what Tim has done with uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, if they wanted me to come up with a whole raft of new stuff, uh, I would enjoy doing that too. I think, you know, introducing Corrin or introducing Baron Fell uh, into the new canon, I think those would probably be the top two on my list. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but you know, just anything. Look, I, you know, I, I love the universe. Uh, I've loved it for years and years and years. Uh, so being able to play there again would be an honor. Nice. So, aside from doing stuff for the new canon, would you also do f stuff for the expanded universe if it got continued, even if it's non-canon? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Mm. But, you know, if if somebody's going to pay me to write Corn Horn stories, fine. I'm there. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> awesome. So, okay. Wedge, next question. Um, so like, have you been keeping up with overall the new canon or like the EU past your, um, your books? Like, have you been a fan like continuously? Well, you have to understand because this is work for me. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't keep current with the books. You know, I, I don't read them, uh, and stay up with them. I mean, one Del Rey stopped sending them to me millions of years ago. Uh, uh, and two, uh, because I've got a lot of other projects going on and there's only so much time in the day, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got other stuff I have to get caught up on. Um, and, and so I just don't have time to read all of that stuff. However, in terms of being a fan, absolutely. I've watched all the new movies, you know, I got Disney plus so I could watch the Mandalorian. Uh, <laughs> nice. I will eventually get caught up on the clone wars and, and, uh, and those shows, um, because, you know, again, I, I still love the universe. Uh, I think it's it's just very, very cool. And uh, and I love seeing what, what's what been done in the new movies. Um, I, uh, I, I will say that when the very first one, when The Force Awakens came out, a friend of mine had gotten uh, me tickets on, uh, on the Thursday evening for a, like a... a eight o'clock in the evening show. And, um, we went, we were watching it. And when the X wings showed up and they were going over that lake and there's lake effect spray, uh, coming up behind the, behind the planes, uh, behind the fighters. I, uh, I gasped <laughs> and my friend giggled and I just turned to her and I said, they stole that from me, you know, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but that was, I mean, that was just the sort of, that was just the sort of thrill, you know, it was like being like watching those first movies again and going, Oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> I see. Indeed. Sp speaking of, um, of what people thought of the movies, what do you think of the overall attitude of the fandom in particular in recent years? Um, you can't lump all fandom together. Um, I think that there are there are tons of people who've enjoyed enjoyed the films, uh, and and I think that that's great. I mean, if what we do, whether it's books, movies, anything else, is bottom line entertainment, and if what we do makes people happy, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who are students of film who have concerns with some of the movies, and I've heard people who I consider very knowledgeable about film, argue both ways about any of those movies, about whether they're good, whether they're bad, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they're flawed or not. Yeah, um, I've heard. You know, and, and, and sometimes I think the, from my point of view, I think the criticism is legitimate. Uh, other times I think that the criticism is a little overwrought. Or overblown. Um, and, and, and look, you know, not everything is going to work for every person. So if you thought a scene didn't work for you or it was too transparent, okay, doesn't mean, you know, that may just mean that you saw through something that 99% of the people didn't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean you're right, but, uh, you know, your opinion is valid. I think that I think that the people who are upset that 
you know, books got decanonized and that, uh, you know, that social justice warriors uh, were putting too much emphasis on this aspect or that aspect. Um, again, they're projecting a lot of their own feelings into this stuff. And it's not that their feelings aren't legitimate. It's just that not everybody shares those. Mm, yeah. I you know, there are other ways to look at it. And, and I'm all for people sharing their opinion. As long as they say, look, this is my opinion. I didn't like this and I liked that. It's when people stand up and say, that was wrong, this was right, and I'm right, and I dare you say anything, that it's like, really, just, just guys, back off, take a half a second. <laughs> you know, I mean, the question got asked a couple of weeks ago on, on Twitter, um, you know, in essence, does the fact that the X-Wing novels have been removed from canon make them less and and my response is if they still make people happy no we have lost absolutely nothing <laughs> you know the books are still doing their job 110 yeah. percent agree yeah. there's a reason why those are the books that i practically reread almost like yearly at this point i just pick up like the first four i'll pick up i jedi and i'm just going to reread them for like the summer during school to like unwind it's because, sure. like you said, they make me happy and they're great in the stories. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we, we re-listen to music all the time. We go back to books that we love because we know that that experience is there. We get a sense of nostalgia. It, it makes it work for us. I mean, there are, there are literally biochemical processes in your brain that reward you for repeating patterns. So, <laughs> you know, this is not a big surprise. And again... Those things still work. So, you know, I do. I wish the stuff was still canon. Sure, because I'd like to see Corrin worked into some of the other the other properties. It doesn't mean that he won't. Um, <laughs> so we just have to be patient. <laughs> for yeah. sure. For yeah, sure. definitely. Uh, some there are a few specific groups I can think of that either are not patient when it comes to getting new content or they bring all sorts of nonsense into Star Wars. I can think of those pol that certain political group I can, uh, that starts with the FM, if you know which one I'm talking about. So, But yeah, <laughs> that's what I can think of. So, Anything else to say on the fandom? Uh, you know, just that, that fans have been unbelievably nice to me. Uh, and... and I, I, I can't thank people enough. I mean, the well wishes that I've got, just the number of people that, that, you know, back when there were conventions, just the number of people that would come up and say, hey, really loved your books, want to shake your hand. Um, you know, that th they remember the books well enough to say thanks. Um, you know, it, it's just great. And like I say, everybody's been really, really nice to me, so. Awesome. I'm waiting for the day you come to like Toronto for like a fan expo or something so I could just hand you all my books and have you sign them. <laughs> like that is like literally a dream. <laughs> you know how many you know how many books those will be which besides Star Wars? Like you probably need to get Battletech and all the others. <laughs> It was recommended was, to me. I will read it, and I'm gonna get that signed too. <laughs> it, was, it, it was really, it was really funny back in back in the late uh, '90s. Um, I think the fourth X-wing book had just come out, and uh, Michael Q B McDowell and I were doing a book tour, and it was a military bases and other things. It was the it was the B level tour. Um, if we were <laughs> if we were musicians, we'd be playing the bars and the honky tonks, not the stadiums. Um, and uh, uh, we were there signing our books, and at every stop, there would be somebody that would have essentially a beer flat, you know, the lower half of a, of a box, uh, just with every single book in it, uh, uh, bringing them to me to sign. And I remember Michael McDowell he would keep looking at me like, you paid him to do that, didn't you? Um, <laughs> so I've been I've been very lucky that I, I, fans have kept my books and and uh, and want to get them signed, and I'm more than happy to do the signing. <laughs> nice, awesome. So, 
Okay. Um, next question. So what has been your recent works? What have you been working on lately? Uh, let's see. What have I been working on lately? Um, I've got a novel in the works uh, that's tied to the computer game Dark Souls. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's in the process of one of the difficulties that's being done for the Japanese. And so uh, translations and editorial and stuff is taking a little bit more time uh, than any of us expected. Uh, but so that'll probably be the next thing that comes up. Um, I also have a uh, Patreon project. Um, I did a, a number of years ago, I did a, a superhero novel called In Hero Years I'm Dead. Uh, and uh, that is sort of the end of the line for a bunch of superhero characters. And with the Patreon project, one aspect that I'm doing with, with that is uh, stories of all those characters as they were beginning their careers, since we've seen how they've ended them. Um, as well, part of the Patreon project is uh, doing a sequel to a fantasy novel of mine. Uh, the the novel was uh, Talion Revenant, and the sequel is Talion Nemesis. Uh, and so I'm in the process of probably another six months we'll we'll wind that book up. So nice, nice, awesome. Is there a place we could find them? Like, are they on Amazon on your website? Uh, the, the, all, yeah, if you go to Amazon and just look my name up on Amazon, you'll see the, just tons of material, uh, including in here are years I'm dead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the, uh, the capital city crime stories, which are related to that. And then, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, on Patreon, uh, so, uh, you can look at the project there and there's, there's, uh, free stories uh, that are part of the Patreon project. So you can. You can try before you buy. That's awesome. Awesome. So uh, we're going to just like for another Star Wars related question, like seeing all this like Disney Plus content, has that inspired you to like want to do something for the Clone Wars, something for the Mandalorian? Well, like, is there anything you want to see them do that you're like, give this to me? I need it. <laughs> <laughs> well i am looking forward to another to to another season of the mandalorian i <laughs> I, uh, I very much enjoyed that i thought that was a lot of fun um you know it's kind of funny i never grew up wanting to write for tv or write for movies mm -hmm. uh and um while i've done some screenplay writing um i'm not really not really well versed in what goes on on so you know there'd be a little bit of a learning curve if i were to get involved but um you know my feeling is that if if disney and and anybody involved with star wars thought that uh my input would be useful uh you know they they know where i live they have my phone number uh they can uh, probably track me through my disney plus uh subscription now <laughs> uh or your and, social media uh, that's it. Yeah, I'll I'll go in and I'll I'll turn the TV on and there'll be a message. You know, Mike call. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean it would be fun to play in that universe again. I would I would greatly enjoy that, uh, and greatly enjoy the opportunity and doing it in a different medium, because uh, I really enjoy doing stuff in comics. Hmm. You know, uh, working on a TV show or a movie would be a lot of fun too. Ah, oh, that's awesome. It's like a triple threat right there: comics, novels, and like movie or show <laughs> yeah well you know you, you gotta you gotta pay the rent somehow <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> so okay watch uh for our last question as much as i want this to go on forever because i just <laughs> this is such an honor to talk with you we need to know who are your favorite star wars characters and why wow um one of the things that is true about about writers is that you find something to love in all of your characters. Mm. Um, so, you know, from the original movies and stuff, you know, I had to say Han Solo is probably my favorite character. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was just he was the one that uh, that, that resonated with me. Corellian blood. <laughs> well, there you go. That is that. You know, that is it. Exactly. You know, I think. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing Wedge. I had a lot of fun writing Corrin. Um, other characters that I created that I enjoyed, obviously we talked about Baron Fell. Um, Tycho. I really, really uh, liked Tycho. Uh, Tycho. 
Um, he was uh, a lot of fun and interesting to do. And I really liked uh, Booster and Murax. Um, they were a lot of fun in the way that they uh, were able to interact and, and uh, with, with everybody. So, you know, I guess those would be my, those would be my favorites. Um, you know, of, of characters that other people created, obviously, you know, Mara Jade, uh, absolutely a favorite. Uh, and, and the race squadron, you know, that's, that's, I mean, you know, Aaron, Aaron was a genius, uh, and, uh, you know, I miss him, you know, miss him dearly. Uh, but at least we have his books to, uh, to, to go back to. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So anything else? I, I'm good there. Okay. Well, with that guys, this was our interview with Mr. Stackpole or Michael A. Stackpole. And so we'll see you guys in our next video. We'll probably see if we get another interview. Maybe next time we'll we'll see if we can get, I don't know, um, Drew Carpishin or some. We'll see. <laughs> so <laughs> with that, we'll say goodbye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.